Okay, so thank you very much, Shuri, for for this um, for letting me in this um, seminars or, or webinars. Um, when I saw it, I thought it was really interesting, and I it was by impulse that I kind of volunteer myself to make a presentation. But actually, when we contact me, I started to think that you know all the presentation that I've seen so far was all on global stuff on. Um, global geodynamics and uh, I was a little bit afraid that my talk will not fit very well so because that's you know it's based on, on some regional work but I'll try to argue here that um, it's it's I'm going to talk of, about the very fundamental problem in geodynamics that has implication as global implications and I'll try to connect it with, with the, the global problems so I'm going to talk about our recent work and the work that we have in our hands on Southwest Iberia. Um, this is the, my co-authors of this work, but um, it's always a bit unfair because I'm leaving a lot of people out. There are for sure like close, around 20 to 30 close collaborators that have contributed to this work in directly or indirectly. And um, more than 100 people that over the years have been working this area, collecting data. So this is just my close collaborators that I've been working so far. So I'm sorry to the others if I'm leaving you out. Um, so some of you that already, you know, saw me, and you know that I like um, always to bring a little bit of historical context to these talks. Um, and in this case, I think it, they are really important. So some of you may know, the ones that don't know, uh, that my object, objective is to inform you, that in 1755, there was a, a huge earthquake of Iberia. It was on 1st of November, uh, on All Saints Day. It was a magnitude, there's a big discussion uh, between uh, around 8.5. I think the most uh, accepted number is 8.7, though some people said it could have been as, as uh, big as nine. Uh, anyway, it was a big earthquake. And it occurred at 9.30 in the morning when people were in the, attending the mass. Uh, almost buildings in the, in the city of Lisbon fell. A lot of people died in, in the churches because the, the roofs fell. Uh, and because there, there was a mass, there was a lot of candles. And this caused fires that last for five days. Most of the people that survive uh, the, the shaking, it was a 10 minute shaking, uh, they, flee to, they fled to the, um, to the waterfront. And 40 minutes after, three giant waves rose through the, the Tagus River and inundated all the, the downtown area, killing a lot of people. And so this was as a, a, a huge impact because Lisbon at the time was a, a big city in, in, in the Atlantic. It was the, the epoch of, you know, that of sailors and Lisbon was in a special place and every, it was a big city and known city. So this caused the attention of countless uh, people all over Europe. Uh, the earthquake was felt as far as Germany and Italy. And this was a special moment because it was the enlightenment period when philosophers were starting to question the position of, of mankind in the world in a way like confronting with the church. And there was two big questions that were talked all over Europe. And one was if this was a natural or a supernatural event if it was sent by God or if it had natural causes, and if it was a natural event, what could that cause it? And it's really impressive because the, from the huge amount of writings that actually uh, some philosophers that tried to understand what that caused the 1755 earthquake, and I'm just putting it as example, uh, the works by the philosopher Immanuel Kant that were written in 1756 about the, the causes of earthquakes. And uh, for some, this is, it's kind of seen as the beginning of modern seismology because he really tries to quantify things. And I, I will recommend for those who are interested to actually go here. So, because there are so many writings, we, this is more or less the area that, over which the earthquake was felt. It was big, as you can see, it was felt as far as Germany. In Scotland, there are reports of lakes that slightly move, was felt in the Azores, and it was felt as far as Cape Verde, with a, which allows us to position the, the, the source of the epicenter of the earthquake 
around here. Of course, this was a historical event, so there was no <laughs> instrumentation at the time. And so we can only rely on this on these descriptions, but because they are many, uh, we have very big confidence that it was here, though this is a very big area. Uh, but okay, 1755 was a big earthquake, but it was not the only one. In 1969, there was another big earthquake uh, of Iberia. It was actually located here. Uh, this was already instrumental one. It was a trust event and produced a small tsunami of about one meter, though it occurred that in February and overnight when, when, when people were sleeping, mo most of the people actually uh, woke up and they ran to, to, the, to the streets. My father felt it and he remembers very well um, that uh, it, was, it was a big one, but it didn't cause many, many damage. So this, because this was instrumental one, we know exactly where it was. And I would like to call your attention that this is the, you know, the earthquakes that in the last century and the 1969 occurred there, but there are also other big earthquakes. Uh, this year it's a, earth, a magnitude 8.1 and 8.4, though these are, are, these are strike slip events and are further to, I will come back to those in a while. So this was also interesting time, 1969. So you may remember that the plate tectonics uh, theory was kind of being consolidated and the, like the, the most fundamental papers on plate tectonics they were published between 65 and 68 and you know in the, in the following years but this was actually like the epicenter of, of the, the earth science revolution and uh, at this time scientists kind of understood that there were two kinds of uh, continental margins. So the, the margins of the continents could come in two kinds. You, you have the margins of the Atlantic that are passive margins. Why? Because you go from continent to the ocean without crossing a plate boundary. And the active margins like the Pacific because you, the, the margins correspond to plate boundaries. And scientists knew by then already that uh, there are big earthquakes in these active margins and normally there are no earthquakes in the passive margins. And if you, we look to this nice picture of Bob Stern, which plots the biggest earthquakes or the ones or earthquakes higher than 8.5 in the last uh, three to three and a little bit more uh, centuries, uh, you see that they all plot around what we now call it the, the ring of fire. So the, the subduction zones around the Pacific. Uh, you have a little bit here in, in Sumatra and you have an exception, which is this earthquake in the Himalaya, though I would argue that this is a continental subduction. So all, all these earthquakes, 8.5, normally correspond to mega trust events in subduction zones. And of course, 1755 is a big outlier here. Like, uh, and I think geoscientists at the time understood that. And so since then many, works have been done to trying to understand why it's happening there, why there is big, this earthquake there in it's really exception. And I hope to kind of inform you about this in my talk. So for, let's continue a little bit more with, with the story. Uh, in 1969, so precisely the, the, the year of the earthquake and a couple of months after, John Dewey came up with this uh, model it, it builds on, on the model of Tuz Wilson that kind of understood that um, the ocean basins involve. But this was the first time that he, he proposed like a really conceptual model, complete one, that he says that oceans go to basically two main phases. They go through a Atlantic type phase where they open and the, the margins of the continents correspond to passive margins. At a certain point, these margins uh, become active and forming subduction zones and the ocean goes through a Pacific uh, phase and in the end, you end up in the Mediterranean phase. So the subduction initiation, like the, the, the moment where active margin transforms in uh, passive margin, sorry, transforms in active margin, it really marks the, the turning point of, of this um, Wilson cycle. And you can imagine that this will have implications at, at convection in the mantle, for example, because everything is moving in one direction and will start moving in another direction. So that's, in that sense, I think that this process is important. Um, and yes, so the, here we have the Wilson cycle, as you know, it's, we teach today in, at universities. Uh, 
uh, here I just put this slide because I'll just like to call the attention. Most of you in this community have know this for sure, but some people may not have this uh, in, in their mind is that the Wilson cycle, of course, is not the same thing as a supercontinental cycle. Because during a su the, the breakup of, of a supercontinent, you may have the formation of several uh, basins. And so, in, and each of these basins will have to close to form the next supercontinent, right? So you have several Wilson cycles in, in one supercontinent, in one supercontinental cycle. So the Wilson cycle basically refers to the, to the history of one of these basins. And if you look at the earth today, so you, we are in a kind of in the middle of a supercontinental cycle in a dispersed phase. Uh, and we see we have different basins uh, that are at different stages of the Wilson cycle. We, you have basins that are closing, that are like the, the Mediterranean basins that closed, the Tetian basin in, in the Himalaya. You have new basins opening in, in, the, in the Arabian Peninsula. You have the, the Atlantic that is a mature ocean and the Pacific Ocean that is already closing or being recycled back in the mantle. But the, the, the really key is how do you go from a passive margin to the active margin? And why? It, this is because as uh, oceanic crust gets older, it, it thickens. So you, you and you see here the, the, the profile that I put from, from Budov, and it, you see that with age, it, it really thickens and becomes really, really strong. So it becomes really difficult to break and bend. And to start the subduction zone, you have to break a passive margin and bend the plate so that the subduction becomes self-sustained. And what we know from calculations is that there are really no forces with the magnitude required to break a plate near passive margins, or it's really rare, or it's in just very particular situations you may have it. But, so this is a kind of what I call the paradox of subduction initiation. And, and it's not what I call, it's what everybody calls. And that, that this is a big field in geodynamics. There's a lot of people dealing with this problem of subduction initiation. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time to present all these works. This is not about that, but there are many people and I, I urge you to, to go and, and look to the publications on subduction initiation. But let's go back to 1969. Uh, I would like to show that immediately at this time, so during this, uh, after the 1969 event, there were a lot of scientists that came to study this area. I, I highlighted here three works. One is by Foucault, that was a seismologist that um, he investigated the, the focal mechanism of the earthquake and he concluded that it was a trust event, a lithospheric trust event. Uh, Mike Purdy, which, which actually is here today he, with us, he, he, he wrote this really nice paper that for me was amazing, that he mentions, he, he, treat, he mentions or he suggests that this area may correspond to a case, to a transient, to a case of transient consumption of the lithosphere. So something between a passive margin and an active margin. So the lithosphere just being uh, starting to be consumed. And, and then Mackenzie, a few years later, he, he uses Southwest Iberia as a, a case example of in this, in this paper on subduction initiation, which is basically the first paper that tries to quantify uh, uh, this process. And in all these three papers, I'd like to call your attention that the authors uh, show the lithosphere being broken. And in this paper by Mark, Mike Purdy, he actually uh, suggests there is a small slab below the this the Orshua Bissau plane. And I would like to call your attention for this crocodile sketch that I will come to, to it a little bit later in the talk. But this was always, for me, the first time I saw it was a little bit strange. Why is this like that? And so, ah, I think just forgot to mention that all these three authors are actually from Cambridge and Cambridge was in, in a way was at the time was epicenter of the revolution of tectonics in Europe. So I, it must have been fascinating to you know to go through that time and to have live be living these discussions and and all these new ideas and and I, with that i can see that southwest iberia was kind of in the epicenter as well because it was it was uh, provoking uh, the, the scientists okay I, I also have to to acknowledge that professor antonio ribeiro 
a few years later, we did, in this case was the first publication with John Cabral that worked with Antonio Ribeiro. Uh, Antonio Ribeiro was the father of plate tectonics in Portugal. He introduced plate tectonics in Portugal. Uh, and um, he kind of proposed that the, what was happening in Southwest Siberia is just a part of a bigger picture. He suggested that all the margin of, of west margin of Iberia was being reactivated. And this was because there were reports of, of earthquakes uh, around near Sinus, earthquakes, big earthquakes in or high magnitude earthquakes in Galicia with tsunamis, mostly historic, historical ones. Uh, there were some signs of reactivation, if you know, in the Galicia banks, and of course in the in the Cantabrian margin, there is a, actually a, a Christianary wage that was deactivated in the in the I think in the I don't remember it was not in the two I don't remember but a few million years ago it was deactivated and we don't know why so so this was this my historical part now let's my second part is let's look to the data so I actually want to show you the data and there's a huge amount but I'll try to focus a little bit so where we are we are in the Astor Gibraltar plate boundary so it goes from the Astor triple junction which is actually a triple zone. Actually, there's a small microplate. And it, there's a transform fracture zone that connects to the Gibraltar arc, which is part of the subduction system that was kind of responsible for the consumption of the Mediterranean. And you see that you go from an extensive regime through a strike slip regime to a compressive regime. Even though we normally mark the plate boundary in this north segment, where you have these eight, 0.4 magnitude earthquakes, like 7.1, 7.1, start, uh, these are instrumental events. Um, there's, I would argue there's another fracture zone to the south, which is also producing high magnitude earthquakes, like this one, which produced 8.1 in, in 1975. And interestingly is that this north fracture zone and the south fracture zone, they kind when they get close to the southwest Iberia, they become like trust systems. Okay, I think you can more or less see it. Um, interestingly, the 1969 occurred right in the middle and far from this one and could not be related with this one because it dips to the south. Um, so, and for many years, while people were looking for this, the source of the 1755 earthquake, the 1969 was the kind of elephant in a room because, you know, people didn't thought about it then thought about it was strange that it will not make sense that it was actually occurred there. And if you look to this map, just, just going to show topography, going to put the faults in a minute, you see that there is a big accretionary wedge uh, related with Gibraltar subduction zone, which has been also proposed as one possible source for the 1755. You have the Gorinch Bank, which is a big mountain that goes from uh, minus five kilometers to minus 26 meters. So it's a huge mountain chain that is higher than the Mont Blanc, is higher than the, the Alps. Uh, and it also, was also proposed as a possible source for the 1755, though the 1969 occurred in the completely flat abyssal plain that I can tell you that is covered with five kilometers of almost undeformed sediments. How can this be? How you can have a magnitude eight earthquake in the flat abyssal plain? And what, especially because I was thinking like that there may not be, there are not many big structures here. So may not be big structures that are capable of, of generating magnitude eight, 8.5 earthquakes. So maybe this, the source of the 1969 was also the source of the 1755. You know, it's, it's the simple explanation. There may be a structure there that is producing big earthquakes. Why too complicated? So we start, I started to think many years, why was this, uh, what may have caused this event? And of course, for many years, there's no answer, there was no answer. So just, just this is just to show you, um, this is a map that I produced uh, during my PhD and was published in 2013. That is a kind of simplified tectonic map of the Gulf of Cadiz. I don't want to go into detail. I just want to show you again that there was this, there is this trust system there, there is this trust system there, and the 1969 earthquake actually occurs in an area that makes very little sense. And to complicate things further, and that's why I go and read the papers and the, the, all the papers, not just the more recent ones, but the older ones, 
is when you look actually go, this is a work by Foucault, he actually, he calculates the focal mechanism, but he actually does something really interesting, which is he uses the aftershocks to propose that the 1969 earthquake occurred in the abyssal area. This is the horseshoe abyssal plane. But he proposes that actually it, it happened or yet uh, been generated in a fault that is dipping to the north. Okay, this is the Gorinji Bank, this is the Orchul this plane. Okay, so it's saying that it's somewhere over here in the fault that is dipping to the north. And when you look to the tectonic map, all the faults in this map, most of the big thrust faults are dipping to the south. How can this be? Right? How can this be? And again, big elephant, nobody really thought about it for many years. Uh, and worst. Much worse. So this is an example of um, a seismic reflection profile, one of the, the many, uh, the dozens that I used to, to make that map. I did it with Pedro Terrinha, my former PhD supervisor. And um, you see that the earthquakes, or this is a, a cluster of earthquakes in the Gulf of Cadiz, or in this area in the Southwest Iberia, they are mostly closer around 40 kilometers depth. When we look to the seismic profiles, we just see the upper 10 kilometers, maybe the upper 20 kilometers. But the lithosphere in this region is about 100 to 120 kilometers thick. Okay, so we are just seeing the upper 10%. When you make these fantastic tectonic maps, we are just actually showing the 10 upper 10 of the of the upper lithosphere so there must be something down there that is not really coupled what with what is happening on at, at the crystal level so this required you know some more investigation and of course for many years there was not enough data and the data started to come that's why these the ideas have to involve with how, how data involved but we actually have a problem because we are around a resolution gap because you cannot really image things that are in the in the middle and the bottom of the lithosphere. We are very good in imaging the crust. We are very good in imaging the mantle, but the lithospheric mantle is still uh, a big challenge. In any case, we have we had tomography available since 2000, and this is a paper by Mark and Gutcher. Uh, based on on Spackman and Vortel tomography, and this paper was about Gibraltar subduction zone, uh, about the big discussion if the subduction below Gibraltar was active or not. And in this tomography, there was something that appeared there that we call it the the finger. And um, and I remember Antonio Ribeiro and a few other colleagues say, "Oh, there's something there." And but of course, most of the people said, "You know, this is is wishful thinking." This is, you know, below the resolution of the tomography. You don't really have resolution to solve that. So, you know, it remained forgotten for many years. Um, but around seven to eight years after, or 10 years for the publication to come up, there was this really fantastic work by Mona et al. Uh, and it was based on, um, on the, on OBS experiments in which we put OBSs on the seafloor on this source to abyssal plain and the Gorinja area for around one year, I think it was eight months. And he used all the stations that I'm showing here uh, and he imaged something there. Again, the finger was there. Okay, this is the, the deep earthquakes. This has more some more recent earthquakes, I think magnitude six, around six. And it's, he imaged something uh, uh, up to a depth of 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers. And he proposes in this paper that this body may have two, two origins. One is that it's a really slab, so paleozoic slab, uh, related with the closing of the tethys or the formation of the Pangaea. But this is not possible because a slab is negatively buoyant. It will not stay there for 200 or 300 million years hanging like that. It will just have sunk in the mantle many million years ago. So it suggests another possibility, which is it's, it's just subduction initiation. It's a new slab. But it, it kind of recognizes that it makes little sense because when you we calculate the amount of, sh of shorting at the surface, we 
end up with numbers of about 20 to 50 kilometers. So how do you put something that is 300 kilometers down just with 20 kilometers of shortening at the surface, one order of magnitude less? It's not possible. It's a geometrical problem. You cannot put a piece of plate down without having the same amount of, of uh, shortening at the surface. So it cannot be. And this, while this was a, a great work, it was clearly Mona and colleagues left open the interpretation because they understood that there was something still uh, to un be unraveled in here. Because there was basically what I'm trying to say is there is no tectonic process that could explain that thing. More recently, a colleague that is part of this work is Chiara Siviero. Um, she was in Lisbon for a postdoc and she produced a new tomographic model of the Iberian region. Uh, she basically used all the stations. She used OBSs that were on the seafloor right on top of this, uh, of this uh, area. And I'm showing here on, on the right um, a slice at 150 kilometers. Okay, so below the lithosphere. And you see something there. Actually, there's the Gibraltar slab. There's a little bit of delaminating. There's a delamination there below Morocco, below the Atlas. You have this thing there. There's something over there. But this thing, it's there. So I call your attention that this is the third tomographic model that visualizes something over there. Is the third. And the three models were made by three different groups, three different teams using, they didn't talk with each other. So I start to think this cannot be coincidence. That thing should be there. It should be real. But what it is? What 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 is that thing? Okay, so I asked Chiara, Chiara, can you know let's investigate this further? And I decided to try to plot a lot of the data that we had. And you clearly see that you know that thing is over there. It goes at least to 200 kilometers. It's right below where you had the 1969 earthquake. It's right below where you have the deepest earthquakes and this cluster there are, and is right below the abyssal plain where there is, everything is flat. So this cannot be a coincidence. Like there, that, there's something there, okay? And you know, people have been saying this for 45 years, there's something there. And we, we are imaging it. So what it is. Um, so just this, uh, I'm sorry for this is a very rough uh, sketch, but I asked Chiara to, do, to, to produce this. This is just for you to have an idea of how this looks in 3D. We may be overestimating a little bit because tomography doesn't really allow it to have very high resolution. So the, sh the size and, and the shape are, are really, there's a, a lot of degrees of freedom, but it's just for you to have a rough idea of the thing that is there. There's something there that shows on tomography and we are we just eliminate everything else around. Uh, before I try to come up with a idea of what this can be, I have to um, introduce two other uh, concepts here that basically are based on two other slides. So this is a, another piece of evidence or another piece of data that we have. This is a seismic refraction profile which was based on, on an active experiment in which we put the, the OBS on the seafloor and we passed with the vessel shooting. And uh, this is basically velocities. And what we want to highlight here, so this is a profile that goes like this, from south to the north. This is the Gorringe Bank. This is the Horseshoe Abyssal Plain, the really flat area, as you see, with the sediment relatively flat. What you see here is that the oceanic crust is missing. You go directly from sediments to mantle velocities. So the, the Cretaceous sediments are lying on top of, of lithospheric mantle. And this lithospheric mantle is actually has been shown that is serpentinized. It's serpentinized lithospheric mantle. Uh, so we are this margin just basically this idea it's known, but it's just to show you to, to stress that this is not a typical margin in the sense that you have typical crust. It's a, a very amagmatic margin with the exposure of mantle. When you have the extension, you expose a lot of mantle. And another evidence that we have that you may actually have a serpentinization front is actually that the earthquakes start 
to actually really uh, be significant below 20 kilometers. Actually, it's where you have most of the, of the events. This is just the distribution of the events and here it's plotted. There's a kind of shadow zone that kind of further shows that there may be uh, serpentinization from, so a weak zone, and this will be important. Okay, so I showed you the history, I showed you the data, and now let's try to converge to the to what makes sense of all of this. So what do we have? We have a blob below a flat abyssal plain. It's right where the 1969 earthquake was, and it has been shown that it's there by three different uh, tomographic models. So what this could what could this be basically? And I for years I thought like I remember to think that after the Mona papers in 2012 and 14 that it, may, it must be artifact. You know, there's nothing that can explain that. Subduction didn't start yet. Like everybody was saying, subduction didn't start. And I agree, there is no subduction there. There is no subduction interface. So how can you put something at 300 kilometers depth without a subduction interface? And uh, it was only when I saw this picture from actually from a work that was done in Morocco, uh, below the, the, the atlas from this Valera et al. That I saw that picture, it's a picture of a numerical model. And I said, oh, funny. This is kind of looks like what we have in, in, in Southwest Iberia. We have something going down to the 400 kilometers without not much deformation at the surface. What, what is the problem with this? Is that this is actually the delamination of the lithosphere. And you know, everybody knows you know, that delamination of the lithosphere occurs in the continents. It, it doesn't occur in the ocean. It doesn't occur in the ocean, it just occurs in the continents. Why? Because if you look at the strength profile of the continents, and this is a simplified one, you have this Christmas tree profile. Sometimes you can even have more like middle crust and things like that. You have these weak layers that allows you the, the, the lithosphere to decouple, especially when you form big mountain chains. You, you form big mountain chains, you form a root, and this root is as excess of mass, of high potential energy, and it kind of separates from the crust. And that's the lamination, this is what we know at lamination. It happens in the continents, it doesn't happen in the oceans. And this is an oceanic lithosphere that is 60 million years old. I told you that in, in, in that area it's 100 and 170 or 150 million years old. So it's like one, 100 kilometers thick or 120 kilometers thick. So it's, it will be huge. Like, how can you delaminate that? I think the key is the is the serpentinization and, and the fact that you don't have the oceanic crust. So if you don't have oceanic crust, if you just have sediments and you have a, a serpentini, serpentinized front you know, near this fracture zone, you may actually weaken it. We know that serpentine, especially when it's stressed, can be really, really weak. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit here, like putting to zero, it's not zero, but, but what I'm just, give you the big picture that you can really remove a lot of the strength and this actually will allow the base of the of the of the lithosphere to just start to sink uh what did we do okay this this just idea um, maybe wishful thinking we decided to test this with numerical models so that's why we did we use for that we, i work with my colleague nicolas Gil, which is now at mines we were together at monash and we kind of develop these ideas over the years. This is very simple models. I'm showing viscosity on the top. Uh, um, this is the shapes on the bottom. You have an African plate uh, with lithospheric mantle, crust and sediments on top. You have a Eurasian plate with lithospheric mantle, uh, this, uh, this serpentinized mantle and crust on top. You have a weak zone, there is a plate boundary, and this is also weak. And we run this model. It's an interesting one. Uh, we see that the, this weak serpentinization layer transforms in the subduction interface, which on itself is a nice result. Though 
we end up with something that does not resemble what we see in nature. It, it doesn't look like. This is what I was telling you, that you have, you know, to have a slab there, you need, you need to have a subduction interface and you need to have a huge zone with deformation like a cautionary wedge. This will imply that the deformation at Southwest Iberia should be extremely uh, deformed and it's not. So this is not a good model. So I say, okay, too bad. But Nicolas, uh, he told me like after that model, he saw that I was kind of sad and said, but João, you, you told me that there was actually two fracture zones. The ones that I showed you in the beginning that, that has one to the north and one to the south. So it's not a simple plate boundary. You have several fracture zones. And I say, oh, let's, let's try to, to run the models uh, with, um, with the two fracture zones. And, and so Nicolas ran the models overnight. And in the morning he came to me and he said, you know, the model is wrong. He said, how do you say the model is wrong? Everything is wrong. Said, how, how can be everything is wrong? Everything is dipping in the wrong direction. And he said, oh, but let me see the model then. And, and this is what happened. It's awkward. Uh, it's awkward to say the least. You see that is a block that kind of detaches and it starts to go on its own and it brings down this plate and you end up with a kind of blob and the subduction zone. A lot of deformation there, but we may not be that advanced in time. So we may actually, if you look to this situation here, to this point, look at this point. What do we see here? You see that there is this block of lithosphere that starts to go down to the north. The north is there. Actually, it's the couple from the crust at the surface which remain relatively flat. And actually, there's a truss there that is actually dipping to the south. So, a big truss dipping to the south, crustal truss, a deeper truss dipping to the north. And this serpentinized material there allows the lithospheric mantle to decouple from the crust. And when I saw this, I said, I remember this from somewhere. I saw, you know, and what is this? This is the corcobar. You see, this is actually not very different from what Foucault and Purdy, and actually this, this um, sketch by Purdy, it's really fantastic that he proposed there is a, a hidden, like a, a blind truss dipping to the north. That is, and at the surface, everything is dipping to the south. And actually there's, you know, this big truss is actually below this flat abyssal plain. So this will, you know, I'm not saying that this exactly, I don't do models to reproduce nature. I do models to test physical hypotheses. And this model just shows that delamination, it's a kind of forced delamination, it's possible. Okay. And then I said, oh my God, you know, they, they saw this 45 years ago. And I went to read the papers again, the Foucault paper and, and Purdy paper. And I was completely amazed. And, and like Foucault mentioned, this mode of consumption is entirely different from Iceland arcs. It's more similar to that in continents. So in saying that there is consumption of lithosphere that is similar to the one in continents. What is that? It's the lamination. It's implicit in this sentence that is talking about the lamination of oceanic lithosphere. And Purdy writes, there's a concentration of mass to the south of the topographic peak, so below the, the flat of the south plain. And he mentioned that serpentinization of exposed upper mantle material will further complicate the structure. So he's saying that this, it's the fact that you have this serpentinized upper mantle that you can actually decouple the crustal level from the, uh, the lithospheric levels. And with that, with these ingredients, you'll have the lamination of oceanic lithosphere. And just to show you, this is just, I'm sorry, this is not a great picture, but this is uh, the, this blob here when it starts to go down and I'm plotting this is the velocity. So the red is high velocities. The blues is almost no velocity. So Eurasia is almost stopped. Africa is moving slow. The block is actually moving faster than the incoming plate. So once this process starts, once you have the, the small kick, uh, small push, then it goes on itself, the gravity, pulls the block and the block goes actually faster than the convergence velocity. So this is actually delamination. So, but it's a forced delamination in the sense that you need to, you need to provide the, a push to start the... Okay, so I'm just going, starting to go 
uh, towards the end and just try to connect this with more global stuff. So it is an early stage of subduct initiation. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, we have, this is just the beginning of, of, of this uh, investigation. We'll have to now uh, go there with more looking, uh, with the more focus on that specific region, but it may be. It could be. It, it's you know, the lamination, this this complication, this serpentinization may allow to actually it may facilitate uh, subduction initiation. And what do you need to have subduction initiation? You have you need to have a few ingredients. You may need to have excess of mass. So you need to have old lithosphere that you, you provide provides you potential energy for for the thing to to start. And here we have we have old lithosphere. We know. You may need to have a driving force. And here we have two, we actually have Africa is converging with Iberia, but we had the big one a few, a few million years ago, which was the Gibraltar arc. A lot of people discuss, oh, the Gibraltar arc is no longer active. It doesn't matter because the process started a few million years ago. So it was active when the process started. So it may be the arrival of Gibraltar arc may actually have provide the initial push for all these things to, uh, in the Miocene. And you know, a widespread deformation all over Iberia in the Miocene. So that may have been when things started. And you need, you may need actually a, a, um, a weakening mechanism. And this may be the hydration of the oceanic lithosphere. And this is much more easy when you have these hyper extended margins because you, you are missing the basaltic crust that works like a seal. Uh, and you need to have a, a fractured zone because otherwise the serpentine, the serpentine itself will just seal the system. So you need to have an ongoing uh, tectonic uh, activity. And if you look here, uh, this will be a completely different uh, presentation, but I'm just tell, going to tell you that there are two other subduction zones in the Atlantic that actually enter the Atlantic along these fracture systems in a way that very similar there are three, and these two develop subduction zones in places where you have an, and the narrowing of the continents that actually allows the passive margins to be close to subduction systems. So again, in these areas, you may have the, the push because you have a nearby subduction zone. You have a passive margin that is old, that has been weakened. And this may add, be part of a bigger picture. And maybe this is just the starting of, of a third subduction system in the Atlantic. Why do you need subduction systems in the Atlantic? So the Atlantic is actually starting to close. That is, that, this means that it's starting to close. I'll argue that not yet, it's not, the, the continents are not converging yet, but once you have subduction zones, you'll probably start, you will start to consume the, the, the oceanic lithosphere. And I would say that this is needed because look at the age of all the oceans in the world. They are in general less than 200 million years. Why? Because lithosphere that is older than 200 million years becomes just too thick and, and it just creates a, a huge excess of mass. And you end up with the huge potential energy of on, on the surface of the earth. This, all these things wants to go down um, to release energy. So, and this is not actually coincidence. And uh, if you look to the works by Bradley, for example, he, he, on the, this is a work on the lifespan of passive margins. What I'm plotting here is the lifespan of 72 passive margins over the earth history. And here's lifespan of passive margins. And it's a, it kind of concludes that all passive margins, all these passive margins are normally cannot live older than two, 300 million years. There's only seven exceptions. So this means that, you know, it may be that after 300 million years, because the, the oceanic lithosphere near a passive margin is underwater, that it just become too weak to support any tectonic stresses and eventually will start to go on itself. We don't have oceanic lithosphere at of this age at the moment, but maybe, and that's something that, you know, I will encourage the numerical models that to global models, that could be a way to, you know, to, to explore that um, maybe you cannot have oceanic lithosphere or passive margins older than 20 million years old. Okay, so this led us to kind of put forward an hypothesis that it's a kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of, consequence of this work is that this is just almost started as an academic almost exercise, but I, I wanted to do a reconstruction of the future that would have in, in 
in, in account these dynamic constraints and that will minimize the excess of mass at, at the surface of the earth. Okay, so that you'll eliminate the, the older lithosphere in a oceanic lithosphere in an efficient way. And for, if you want to do that, you have, you know, you have the, the Pacific closing. I would argue that the Atlantic is starting to close. It will start to develop subduction zones. This will grow. Subduction zones are like small nucleation cells. And once they start, it's really difficult to stop them. There's also some work on that. In a few million years, you may have the Pacific and the Atlantic closing, and you have forming a new ocean. This may not be very uh, crazy because actually there's a circuit here that is still um, not closed. You know, there's a lot of rifts developing in this area. And actually for the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean to close, you actually have to develop a new ocean that I would argue that will be, it may be uh, in between Eurasia. But I'm not saying that this is the future, I'm saying that this is a possible future. This is a reconstruction by Anna Davis. Uh, Anna Davis talked here last week. And uh, this, that started with a kind of academic exercise. We actually, Anna actually reviewed all the future models. So she, she reviewed Amasia, Nova Pangea, Pangea Proxima. She made the, these reconstructions with G plates. So if you are interested, it's a very nice. The, 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 the files are available. So you have, this is a kind of, I would say this is one of the end members of several possibilities. Um, but why why do we do we care? So basically, we have other works going on in which we are modeling different uh, possible modes of evolution of the supercontinents. You know, you, you know this much better than me. The uh, extroversion, introversion combinations, and things like that. But we are modeling uh, tides and uh, oceanography, and we are actually also modeling the, the climate, how the climate will evolve in the, during the evolution of a supercontinent. And uh, I would just li I'd like to highlight, um, this will be a completely different talk, but that we found there is a, a super tidal cycle. There's a cycle of tides associated with, a, with a, the supercontinent, and this is because the tides are really dependent on the shape of, of the basins. And so if you are interested in the global implications of this academic exercise, these are, are a few examples. And so I'll, I'll finish here. I think I'm exceeding a little bit the time. Uh, this is, this work is mostly, it was not published yet. Uh, it, uh, it involved the combination of a lot of different data sets and uh, complex modeling or testing different ideas. So, but uh, I made a presentation uh, one year ago and the, this, this science writer, Maya, who I asked, she published a really, really nice article about this work. And uh, so if you are interested, you can go back to it. Uh, and thank you, I'm here and I'm open to your, to your questions.